I am Bill Cortright with Living Right with Bill Cortright. And this is the Stress Mastery Podcast, where we take you from the science to the spirituality of stress mastery. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Stress Mastery Podcast. I am, and I am here with California-bound super millennial David Barreto. You're ready, aren't you? I am ready. Are people ready for you? I don't think so. Honestly, I may not come back. I, I know. You haven't been there. Wait till you feel it. It's an energy. <laughs> California is very special. So this week's been a blast as our focus has been on the freedom value. On Motivational Monday, we addressed the question, is freedom for sale? Tuesday's health huddles, we talked about the freedom of health. Wednesday's Meeting of the Minds, we had a great interview. Wow, did we get feedback on that one, right? Yeah. Dave Conley, what a great. It. Listen, if you haven't heard that one, listen to it. It's really a good interview with Dave Conley. And on Connection Thursday, we had a little light topic on enlightenment. And today, we continue with Monty Taylor's book, The Power of Heart Language. And we are beginning Chapter 2, The Habitude of Embracing Forgiveness. So... This, book, this chapter starts with, the, the weak can never forgive. Forgiveness is an attribute of the strong. Mahatma Gandhi. Good one. Good one, right? The, so this is titled, the first one was the right one. Some people have a formable gift for helping others see what they haven't been able to see before. Leyland Val Van de Wall was one of these extraordinary life teachers. Val is what his students and friends call him. Whenever Val held a workshop, he purposely set the stage by placing a sizable whiteboard and at least two tables at the very front of the room and with it, they were within his reach. On them, he carefully positioned hundreds of personal items, dog-eared newspapers, magazine articles, photos, keepsakes, cartoons, books, trivia, and notes. So at any moment, he could grab one of his props to emphasize a point share a laugh, or introduce a supporting idea. He was a full-on spiritual tutor, a professor with a knack of en for entertainment, patrolling his stage like a wily method actor, carefully leveraging his memorabilia while serving up his personal brand of show and tell. I vividly recall one weekend when Val read a short newspaper article and reported the alarming statistics for divorces in North America. Show of hands, he asked, how many here are married? More than half the room raised their hands. Don't be shy, he challenged. Stand up if this is your second marriage, third or more. Teetering and laugh. Why are you laughing? Why is that funny? He took a perfect pause. I, <laughs> I don't understand you. Why are you laughing? All right. As we continue, tittering and laughing, a surprising number of individuals arose while the others looked around to count the members of the Multiple Marriages Club. I, too, raised my hand and stood. Pausing momentarily for effect, Val announced firmly, everyone standing. Please listen carefully. It's critical that you understand this. Then he wrote and underlined the following words on the whiteboard. The first one was the right one. Val turned back around. Why are you laughing again? This is killing you. I'm this is going to be one of those episodes. I'm glad me. you're entertained. I'm going to get even. Don't worry. Val turned back around and asked if everyone in the group could see what he had written. Although I wasn't aware of it at that very moment, I later realized he was waiting to see who would be the first to take some offense or question this astonishing declaration. I could sense the confusion charge atmosphere in the whispers and a murmur from the audience. Since no one seemed to have the courage to confront him, Val tossed out his oral bait once again. In case you're not clear, let me repeat. If you have remarried, you should know that the first one was the right one. Your first marriage was perfect for you. Visibly distressed and her voice wavering, one woman began to protest. Mr. Van de Wall, I'm upset. I bet. <laughs> I don't know why you would say this to us. My second husband, Dave, is sitting here next to me. We've been happily married for 16 years and he's a lovely man. My first husband was a total jerk. 
And what followed were several minutes of the woman's emotional and somewhat entertaining confession of her previous <laughs> husband's sins. You can see that, right? Yes. So Val listened patiently, inviting her to continue. How could you possibly tell me my first husband was the right one? She asked again. Because he was the right one, Val answered, as if his argument was utterly unassailable. Your first husband and all the people in your life are there for a reason. And one of the most important reasons is so that as a spiritual being, you can learn everything you need to know about compassion, love, and forgiveness. So do you see what happened there, right? The woman is still carrying that first husband. She's still with the first husband. Mm -hmm. People understand what he was trying to get his point. The people... It was still with her. She's still with her first husband. She's arguing. She's defending it. And she's carrying her husband where, David? Everywhere. <laughs> yep, because it's where? In her subconscious. It's in her it. cage. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. So she's at, very good. She's carrying him everywhere. <laughs> so she's still with the first one. So it starts here. And Monty goes, forgiveness, the second language of the heart. So he continues. Val asked us to carefully consider that every single relationship in our life is the right one for that moment of time. You must entertain the possibility that life is a school that contains all things you need to know about being fully human. Excellent stuff, because he's absolutely right. After 12 or more years of education, you may have learned how to diagram a sentence or argue the square root of pi. However, you have typically studied nothing about the real power of forgiveness or what can happen to your lives and your health if you hold on to anger, hatred, or recriminations. The school of all about your life is always in session and your schooling ends when your life ends, he added. By challenging us with this, the first one was the right one, Val implored us to learn that every relationship in our life has a gift for us, no matter how frustrating, disappointing, or painful it seemed at the time. For our spiritual advancement as human beings, we must learn to look back, learn to let go of the hurt or anger, and to find the parts of the relationship for which we can be grateful. The power of learning to be grateful for the lessons leads to forgivingness, forgiving ourselves and forgiving others. Again, let us not look backward in anger nor forward in fear, but around us in awareness. There's a quote for you, right? <laughs> so Val would continue to invite discussion and then probe what was the gift, what was the lesson that helped you grow and evolve so you could become the kind of person who is capable of attracting the love of your second husband? What was the connection that led you to the next and then to the next and forever changed your life for the better? So here's the one thing I say about forgiveness, David, and you know I talk about the art of forgiveness, and I practice this dearly in my life. It's how I can do what I do today. I don't hold any resentment to my mother. I don't hold any resentment to anybody from my past because I understand the art of forgiveness. And here's the art. You have to forgive with all your heart and then forget. So don't try to get back at me later. And I won't, <laughs> but I, I will later. But you know what I mean by that though? So the woman... She could. She may have said, "Well, I forgive him," or whatever. Or maybe she never forgave him. But if she did forgive her first husband, she hasn't forgotten. Mm -hmm. So if you say you forgive somebody, really forgive them, even if you say, "I forgive myself," and you're still talking about it that night, or you're talking about it a week from now, or you're talking about it ten years from now, you haven't forgiven because you're still carrying it within the subconscious cage. Forgive, forget, and be. That's the secret. So that takes us right into the part of the book where we get geeky and we talk about the science of forgiveness. That's why I love Monty. There's a reason I picked this book. So the science of forgiveness. Monty goes on. Decades worth of research on forgiveness has arrived at a common conclusion. Forgiveness is not only healthy for our minds and bodies, 
It's healthy for our relationships too. And the happily and benefits of forgiveness may go well beyond the positive consequences generally suggested in the domains of psychology and health. University studies involving hundreds of graduates across two continents reported that the act of forgiveness improved the student's performance measured via physical fitness testing tasks. In contrast, participants who recalled incidents marked by a lack of forgiveness and failing to forgive demonstrated noticeably reduced performance measured by the evaluative fitness tasks. So researchers speculate that a state of unforgiveness is like carrying a heavy burden, a burden that victims bring with them when they navigate the physical world. Forgiveness can lighten that heavy load. It was noted that the victims who are unable to reconcile with their offenders feel a sense of powerlessness. Withholding forgiveness may decrease the availability of physical resources. Are you ready? David, it, it, it decreases the available re physical resources of blood glucose, for instance, that could otherwise be used to cope with phys the physical challenges such as jumping or climbing a hill. You know what that is, right? The stress response. I was going to say, yes. trying to survive. It's the stress response. Imagine, you're carrying anger with you. The, body, the subconscious doesn't care or analyze or understand why you're angry. It only does what it does. Mm -hmm. It responds. So you can be angry as well. I got people that have, have that have been angry at their parents and they've been dead for 20 years. I mean, yeah. come on. Like I didn't get a you chance to get back on that go, right? <laughs> so Bhakti goes on. Another study evaluated the effects of self-forgiveness and self-compassion. This is self-forgiveness now. The researchers carried out an experiment involving healthy young adults who were asked to endure standard unspecified laboratory stressors and have their stress levels measured before and after. Participants with higher self-compassion and self-forgiveness demonstrated significantly lower levels of stress as measured by testing the concentration of an anti-inflammatory, I'm sorry, of an inflammatory agent linked to stress called interleukin-6, IL-6. By the way, interleukin-6 is what happens when, if you get in a fire, this is released to increase inflammation and help the body to heal, like if you were to burn yourself. So when you have a lot of stress and there's a lot of um, IL-6 in there, then that's showing increased inflammation in the body. And inflammation is what causes aging and disease and, well, death. All right, <laughs> so test subjects with lower self-compassion and self-forgiveness ex exhibited significantly higher baseline stress levels, especially when subjected to anything annoying. You know, people that can't handle anything, the little things that irritate them, it's because they're carrying too much crap in the cage. There's no room for peace in the cage. Too many programs. So the study findings suggest that self-compassion and self-forgiveness and letting yourself off the hook may serve as a protective factor against stress-induced inflammation and inflammation-related disease. It's important to note that psychological stressors and the resulting inflammation were linked to multiple diseases, including cancer, heart disease, Alzheimer's, and other neural, neurological disorders. The Stanford Forgiveness Projects are the largest research-tested methods for forgiveness ever conducted. And if you want to know what that is, you can go to www.learningtoforgive.com to check that out. The, power, the powerful therapeutic model combines guided imagery, imagination, where's the imagination? In the art. Stress management and personal story therapy to help people unravel the grievance process. The program teaches that pain and disappointment need not control you. The project's research findings reveal that forgiveness isn't wishful thinking. It's a trainable skill and a method of forgiving almost any conceivable hurt can be demonstrated. And this demonstrates that forgiveness can significantly improve a person's physical and emotional well-being and restore a victim's sense of personal power. So this is one of the most important things when we talk about coaching. Uh, I keep going back to step four, the let go technique. I was just about to say it's, that's all. So it's everything, right? So we do these steps 
Uh, and these steps work. There's nobody who follows these steps can fail because it's just designed to work the way we're wired as human beings. It's a truth, right? So that, that let go technique, if you're not doing that all day long, every time you get upset, well, then you're allowing the program to stay in the cage. And forgiveness is one of the best exercises you can do. If you have any type of resentment, anger, hate in you, and you can let that go, Oh my gosh, it just changes your state immediately. Especially when you get a chance to notice that you really, the moment that you notice you really forgave somebody and forgot, is when you see them again and they're apologizing and you're like, for what? <laughs> it doesn't even like, resonate, huh? like, right? No, 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 don't yeah. worry about it. You're still worried about yes. that? Yes, they're you still know? carrying yeah, it. Yeah, you're yes. like, no, I'm good, don't worry. So it goes on, it's good stuff. Monty goes on, some researchers propose that forgiveness dramatically changes an individual's biological equilibrium. I know it does. Because what Monty is saying, we know because it's about the red zone, green zone. If you go in the green zone, you're going to change the body's ability to repair, equilibrium, homeostasis, right? So he goes on, advanced scientific tools offer us the ability to go beyond self-reporting questionnaires, interviews, and group sessions and help scientists more accurately measure neurobiological responsiveness. New studies assess blood pressure, heart rate, emotional imagery, facial EMG, skin conduct, conductance to evaluate enhanced therapeutic outcomes related to forgiveness. And it's opposite to unforgiveness. So this is the physiology that we talk about red zone and green zone. So Monty continues. There is an outpouring of new data and information focused on measuring the effects of forgiveness on stress, happiness, coping with major illness, alcohol and drug abuse, <clears throat> excuse me, grief, loss, violence, marital distress, divorce, relationships, intergroup conflict, and post-traumatic stress disorders. These are only a handful of the hundreds of completed studies on the science of forgiveness. You guys are getting this, right? This is real stuff. This isn't, this isn't that foo-foo stuff. This is science. And it's powerful. The majority of these projects are considering how forgiveness can enhance physical, mental, and spiritual recovery. The results confirm the social and psychological benefits of forgiveness and relationship restoration. So the choice to forgive is the next session, and it goes, the choice to forgive an inner decision. So many of the greatest philosophers and teachers, countless books, scriptures from the Bible, and other religious texts single out forgiveness as one of the most important values of life. Forgiveness is essential in the teachings of Taoism, uh, Confucianism, Christianity, Judaism, Islam, Buddhism, and a critical point of virtually all spiritual practices. I will tell you, there's a course called the Course of Miracles, and you do it for 365 days, and the whole course is around one thing, forgiveness. <laughs> the whole course is literally a course on forgiveness. That's what it is. So for those who have experienced terrible tragedies at the hands of others, Intentional or unintentional, forgiveness seems contrary to all logic. And I personally understand that. How can one possibly forgive physical or mental abuse that has occurred for years? Again, I personally understand that. How can one let go of betrayal that has disintegrated a family or violence and hatred that has destroyed lives? I completely understand that. And what about those times when you are the betrayer and the perpetrator of an action or an event that has harmed others and ourselves? So I will tell you, it's the forgive and forget policy. But it's understanding as you go up and you start to rise in your state, I could actually look at my mom on her deathbed and have no resentment at all because I understand it wasn't her. She lived through this belief. She lived through these concepts. She lived through her cage. She lived her life. And I don't know how she got that way. Mm -hmm. And that's not my problem to know because I can't control what happened, but I sure can control my response. And I chose to forgive many, many years ago. It's why I don't talk about the abuse because I don't carry it in the cage. In fact, David, I'm not even sure before I did an episode you even knew anything about it. Did you? No, Seven I, years. Yeah, we may have had one conversation and I brought it up. And I've never talked yeah. because it doesn't, I don't carry it. It's not that I'm ignoring it because I had to deal with it. Mm -hmm. People, I'm not saying I didn't deal with it, didn't work on myself because I worked on myself hard. I really did. And I had to go in deep. But I'll tell you, once I released that program, oh, 
Man, if you guys are carrying that out there and you're carrying it with you, there's nothing more. We're talking about freedom, the freedom value. There's nothing more freeing than releasing something like that, especially if you've been abused. And you can let that go. And I could. I could actually love her on her deathbed because I was good. I got it. I even told her, go. I'm okay. You did a great job. Because I wouldn't be teaching today. And so we went back to what Val said, right? You go back to your, your history. I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing today if I didn't have the childhood I had. It's mm -hmm. fact. Yeah. This is why I'm doing it. So I'm changing millions of lives because I had an abusive childhood. So that's what the truth is. So... It continues, anger, hurt feelings, guilt, resentments, hatred, and self-loathing are strong feelings, emotions that are likely to visit each of us sooner or later and are a natural part of the great human experience called living. But anger, resentments, hatred, and unforgiveness has dire consequences as Frederick Buchner described so powerfully. Of the seven deadly sins, anger is possibly the most fun. To lick your wounds... To smack your lips over grievances, people bitching and complaining, long past gone, to roll over your tongue at the prospect of bitter confrontation still to come, to savor that last toothsome, toothsome morsel, be both the pain you are given and the pain you are going to give back. In many ways, it's a feast fit for a king. The chief drawback is that what you are wolfing down is yourself. The skeleton is the feast. The skeleton at the feast is you. And that's the anger energy because it keeps you in the red zone. And so that's the truth. Um, this, is a, this is from Buddha. Holding on to anger and resentment is like grasping a hot coal with the intent to throw it at someone else, but you are the one getting burned. It's, and, and it's they're absolutely what they're saying is true. Few people realize the tremendous positive impact one's ability to forgive has on their happiness and health. And how can we learn to access enough love, self-love, and empathy for others in order to experience the benefits of physical, spiritual, mental health, and greater happiness? How can we learn to offer, accept, ultimately embrace forgiveness, perhaps even pass it on to our children as an enduring legacy? Well, part of that answer... This is very important. I thought that Monty did very well with this. Part of the answer rests in accepting our humanness. That's what it is. Accepting that they're human. They live in a cage. They were programmed. They're unconscious. They're in survival energy. They don't know what they do. What did the great man say from the cross? Forgive them because they don't know what they do. It's a truth. It's the greatest truth ever ever taught and if people can grasp that you can change every aspect of your life so Monty goes on the ability to access our ultimate power begins the moment we realize that no one makes us unhappy or sad remember what did I teach you what, what aggravated you Dave when you said that to me <laughs> yes no one can make you feel anything truth no one can make you do anything. Nobody can make you feel anything. So this is what he's saying. The ability to access our ultimate power begins the moment we realize that no one makes us happy or sad and our emotions don't happen to us much as we choose them. They don't happen. We choose them. Uh, the great Greek teacher, one of my, I think I got him right behind me, Epictetus, uh, declared that all unhappiness arises from our futile attempts to control events and people over which we have no power, and this ongoing and useless endeavor weakens the body and leads us to disease. That is the want of control. And the moment that that is activated, you lose freedom. And that's what we talked about today. Try to control anything and you lose freedom. So I'm going to close this today. I have time, right, David? I'm a little bit over. I don't want to go too far over. Martin Luther King, and this is the last part of this, Jr. once wrote about Jesus command to love your enemies. And I would like to read this. Forgiveness does not mean, this is from Martin Luther King, by the way, Martin Luther King Jr. Forgiveness does not mean ignoring what has been done or putting a false label on an evil act. It means rather that the evil act no longer remains a barrier to the relationship. We must recognize that the evil deed of the enemy neighbor, the thing that hurts, never quite expresses all that he is. An element of goodness may be found even in our worst enemy. 
Now we can see what Jesus meant when he said, love your enemies. We should be happy that he did not say, like your enemies. It is almost impossible to like some people. Like is a sentimental and affectionate word. How can we be affectionate toward a person who avowed aim to crush our very being and to place innumerable stumbling blocks in our path? I will tell you this. I didn't like my mom. I told you that, haven't I? Mm -hmm. I didn't like the woman. But I love her. She's my mom. She's a human being. So Martin Luther goes on. How can we like someone who is threatening our children or bombing our homes? That is impossible. But Jesus recognized that love is greater than like. And when Jesus bides us to love our enemies, he is speaking of understanding and creative and redemptive goodwill for all man. Only by following this way and by responding with this type of love are we able to be children of our Father who is in heaven. Great, right? Mm -hmm. So, Christianity. People, all my Christian brothers and sisters out there, I'm going to tell you this. Christianity is not a religion. It's a movement. And it's a movement of forgiveness. Because the great teacher that started this movement was all about one thing. And that was forgiveness. David, anything more? I think, for me, the biggest way or the, the easiest way I understand forgiveness and the reason why I don't hold many things for anyone, it's hard for me to even recall one, is because I just have empathy knowing that, look, I, I, I get it. Just go ahead and get it out. I, I know if that know. makes you feel better and it's not yep. hurting me, then I'd rather you do that than ball it up and have a hate for me when I really don't have anything towards you. Just being able to understand or be able to share you know, the emotions that they're having and feel sorry for him. So yeah. you look, I understand Empathy, it. right? And yeah. Martin Luther King Jr., that was a great talk because it's true. You don't have to like somebody. Mm -hmm. You have to love them because you know they're a human being. You don't have to like them because if you like them, you're liking their concept. Yeah. If you love them, you're loving who they are. That is one of the most profound teachings that somebody could pass on to themselves and to their children. I don't, I never, I remember that. I remember, and I'm going to talk about, we were talking about enlightenment. I'm going to talk about one of those things that happened when my mom died. I started crying out of nowhere. And I don't even know why. And I thought to myself, first thing I thought is, I don't even like this woman. That's the truth. <laughs> yeah. This is the, de I'm telling you guys the truth. And this was the first big release I had into that, that energy we talked about yesterday. But you don't have to like everybody. But. You also have to have empathy because they don't know. That's their concept. That's their belief. That's their issue. And nobody can make you do anything. Nobody can make you feel anything. You have the power of how to react and to respond. And that's it for today's show. Our mission is to create a shift in the planet. This show got deep. Didn't expect that. And you can join us on this mission by simply like, share, and subscribe. The links are right below the show. Let's get out of here, David. As always, until next time, stay inspired.